Hello, I'm uh, Sebastian. I work as a strategist for Catcoon, and we're a company who deals with uh, closing the digital gap between business uh, design and development. So we look for initiatives and opportunities and successfully put digital proje projects and uh, products into the world. So um, today I want to talk about Web3. Uh, Web3 is something new. A lot of uh, innovations are today are being installed. But what is actually Web3? Well, Web3 is actually the new iteration of the internet. So, and it has two uh, very important key ingredients. So one of the ingredients is decentralization, and the other one is autonomy. But today, it's more or less a catch-all term for a lot of innovations, technologies. So Web3 is stable coins. It's Ethereum, Bitcoin, blockchain. It's gas fees. It are DAOs, smart contracts, tokens, peer-to-peer, play-to-earn. And today, we'll try to grasp an idea of what that Web3 thing actually is. So we can say now it's mainly work in progress. So it's not finished yet. To get that idea, we have to go back to uh, what it was in 1991. When we had Web1, it was only static pages on the internet. So I have a website, and you could read it. There was no possibility to log in or to commun communicate. It was just static. Web2 as from uh, 2004 until now, it's read and write. So big revolution, we can log in, we can commun communicate, we have social media, we can Zoom, we can do whatever we want, we can even rant on the forum of at last the news. <laughs> Web3 will be the next iteration, it will be read, write and own. And the own part is the autonomy. So the user will, be will become very important. So um, this is my hamburger. I tried to draw something that could be like an ecosystem of Web3. It was too difficult. So I took the layers of a hamburger. For us, Web3 consists out of five pillars. It's the DAO. It's artificial intelligence. It are smart contracts. It's tokens. It's blockchain. And they all come together in Web3. But who is actually responsible for Web3? Well, Web3 is coined by this guy, is Gavin Wood. He's the co-founder of Ethereum, uh, one of the major blockchain networks around today, doing a lot uh, to make the technology better and more innovative. And he coined it as less trust, more truth. And less trust is very important because today we 100% trust big companies uh, with our data. So he wants the trust coming back to us as a user. He wants more truth because we're going to work together without an intermediary and there must be uh, some sort of truth through the blockchain technology. We'll discuss that later on. So what happens in this uh, Web3 environment? So data today is we log into Facebook, we reproduce into Google, we reproduce again in Twitter or in our account in Amazon. So in the future, we'll be the center of it all. So we'll decide how to interact with all these platforms. So that's the autonomy part. But again, bear with me. I will come to that later on. So we'll start with the first ingredient, the blockchain. The blockchain, you all know it probably from Bitcoin and Ethereum. The blockchain is actually a giant ledger on which uh, transactions are kept chronologically in a chain. So you have one block, you have a new block, that new block refers to another, to the first block, and so on. So we have one big chain that follows closely to each other, and the new block always refers to the previous block. So what is the difference between like a normal ledger? So this blockchain is not kept on a central place. It's kept on different computers. It's distributed, as we call it. So that's um, to give you an idea how it works. It works like this. So today, we have one central server and computers connect. So it burns, the server is down, no one can work. In a blockchain environment, one computer burns, the three others keep on working because they all have the same ledger on their computer. 
So for instance, I'm a student philosophy and I had exams in uh, January. I didn't pass one of my exams. So here, I know the entrance into the server. I can change my, uh, my grades and pass the exam. If I want to do it in a blockchain environment, I can't do it because the other computers will say, hey, you changed something to the ledger and it doesn't fit anymore the other ledger. So we're gonna burn you and kick you out of the blockchain. So that's really important uh, today that we're going from central to decentral. So who's responsible for all these decentral shenanigans? And that's Satoshi Nakamoto. This uh, crazy looking guy uh, wrote in a 2008 a white paper, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. He's the founder of Bitcoin. In 2009, on the 3rd of January, he mined his first Bitcoin with the Genesis block. And then he disappeared from the face of the earth. So nobody knows who he or she or it or whatever he is or she is. They never saw him again. So um, this is the Genesis block of a Bitcoin. So this is how a first block looks like in the chain of that giant ledger. And um, Nakamoto is a very funny guy. So he added on the a headline of the Times newspaper of the 3rd of January, 2009, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. With this message, message he tried to uh, warn people about how the bank system as we know it isn't that strong and their Bitcoin will be stronger than ever, will uh, we'll survive every crisis. We all know that is, that's not true because uh, somewhere 2021, they were almost at 70,000 and today I think it's more or less $22,000. So Bitcoin is also um, a bit vulnerable, but still it is a very important technology. Fun fact, the newspaper, the times of the 3rd of January, uh, 2009 is now sold for in between $250,000 until $1 million. Uh, luckily, you get a, a, a certificate of authenticity with that. But it's really crazy because a lot of people pay a lot of money for everything that's connected to Bitcoin, to blockchain, or to Web3. So the first ingredient was the blockchain, the decentralized uh, uh, ledger, so where all the transactions are kept chronologically. So in a decentralized uh, environment, we don't have any intermediary, so there is no uh, person in between who deals with all our transactions. So we have to deal it with ourselves. So this problem they tackled with smart contracts. Smart contracts are really simple digital contracts. It's a piece of code on the blockchain. And it says when you reach this or that condition, it automatically will start working. So that's a smart contract. Nothing more, nothing less. It's really easy. So 2017, AXA, the uh, created Fizzy, a uh, really small experiment. Simple idea, so uh, you get this insurance. When your flight uh, is delayed with two hours, you will get paid automatically. So there is no intervention of AXA anymore. So your flight is delayed, you get your money back. Happy customer, happy uh, insuring company. So because they don't, do, don't have to do anything. So this is all very premature. What I'm talking about is today is all very premature. It's also very hype. So uh, blockchain is hype, smart contracts are hype, but bear with me because it's gonna be it's gonna become more functional in the end. So we're already at the tokens. For me there are three important tokens. Governance tokens, native tokens and NFTs or non-fungible tokens. We all know NFTs, but I will start with the governance tokens. Governance tokens are used to vote. So I have a governance token. Um, I can vote uh, within uh, the DAO. Right? We saw the bun of the hamburgers, the DAO is the organization. So with no intermediaries, we, have, we need to have an organization and we need to have a system where I can vote, where we can 
communicate in a democratic way where we can take decisions, initiatives, where we can do everything we want. When I vote, it can be that uh, the smart contract says, okay, when Sebastian votes, he gets native tokens. Native tokens are financial compensations. So for instance, a Bitcoin, Ethereum, or uh, a, sm a smooth love potion, which we'll see later on, or mana, which we'll see later on. So that's a native token. So it's a financial compensation. And then we have the non-fungible tokens. We all know NFTs. Everyone, I think everyone knows NFTs. So I have the most expensive one today, I think. I think. It's 91.8 million for this piece of art by Pack the Merch. Now, the most interesting thing about this piece of art is that it's, uh, it's an artwork that's divided in 300,000 fractions and almost more or less 29,000 owners have some fractions of that artwork. So uh, the most expensive one until today is every day is the first 5,000 5, 5, days whew, uh, by people. It's sold for $68 million. So it's crazy prices for some bits and bytes. But really, the, the fractions of the NFT makes it a really powerful tool. We'll come back to that later. So then there is also the Jack Dorsey first tweet, the founder of Twitter who sold his first tweet. You know all the story. Uh, $29 million for a simple tweet. Uh, the guy who bought it wanted to sell it on OpenSea. It's an NFT marketplace for more or less $48 million. And it didn't work. So. Uh, the NFT doesn't have any reselling power, so your other should buy uh, a nice pair of Jordans because they have more reselling power than the tweet of Jack Dorsey. I think he more or less got like $10,000 for the first tweet, so 2.9 2 million compared to 10,000. It's crazy. But then the NFT is really a powerful tool. It's not because here we have like pump and dump situations where Oh, if everything gets hyped, people pay a lot of money. It's really cool to see how NFTs work because it's also a tool to make copyrights, for instance, uh, uh, to store copyrights or to store medical documents or whatsoever. So it's something really unique. Yeah? And what's, what's unique about the NFT, that it's unique. So you can't, there's like one NFT, there are not two the same NFTs. So that's the power of the NFT. And it's also used in play to earn games. So a play to earn game, so um, actually it's a pay to earn game. So it's a little mistake. So you pay and you start to earn. So uh, you have to uh, buy three NFTs to gain. So this is, uh, does anyone know Axie Infinity? It's similar to Pokemon Go. So uh, me as a person, I buy three of these little Axies that are my NFTs, and I can play a game like Pokemon Go. So what can I do? I can, this Pokemon can, well, Axie can fight another Axie. And when it wins, I get Smooth Love Potion. Smooth Love Potion is the native token of uh, Axie Infinity. So that native, native token I can use to breed new Axies, or I can sell my Axies and get more Smooth Love Potion. And I actually, I also can redeem my smooth love potion into Ethereum or Bitcoin and eventually into euros, into dollars. So the cool thing about decentralization, autonomy, smart contracts, tokens, that it can create a full economy that's totally on its own. And that came, became real during lockdown. So actually infinity became a job for a lot of Filipinos during the Corona lockdown. So a smart Filipino started playing Axie Infinity, was like, hmm, I can earn some money. So uh, he told his friend, and they, they start playing Axie Infinity. Even some more smart uh, Filipinos, they had the idea, okay, uh, it's becoming more expensive because the economy is, is going rather well today, so the price is rising, so they can't pay for the Axies anymore. So we're gonna start an Axie scholarship. We're gonna rent out our Axies in change for a little bit of smooth love potion for the win. So a lot of people started playing this game. Unfortunately, with all things uh, with Web3 today, it's also very vulnerable. So what happened? Uh, 
too much sweet love potion, so uh, it was not worth the money anymore. So a lot of people invest a lot of money, earn a lot of money, but they didn't cash out in time. There is a crisis, though they don't have any money. So some got really rich and others, yeah, just stayed poor. But still, for us, the future is tokenized. Since we are now talking about digital stuff, you can always tokenize also physical stuff. So for instance, I can tokenize this building and we can divide uh, the token among all of us. So everyone can have a small part of this business. So what does it mean for business, for instance? Well, Polestar just saw the power of token and blockchain. So they started tokenizing uh, cobalt in their batteries. So to see how climate neutral they are. So the token is the one and only truth. So within the token, everything is truth. So nothing can tamper with that. The blockchain also keeps everything together. So nobody can change or modify what's in the token. So uh, for instance, for Polestar, this means like the cobalt comes from that mine, goes to that part, goes to that part, goes to that part, until it goes back to the recycling facility. Everything is mapped out so you know where the cobalt will be at a certain moment and nobody can change that. So this is really good in the race to become more climate neutral. Today in Antwerp we have tea mining um, and they tokenize containers. So yeah, um, in Antwerp we have a big problem with containers. But when we start tokenizing it, we know that the container from Panama towards Antwerp, we know every step of the way where it is. So we know it's always at that place and it's that person who's handling the container. So there's no more messing around with pin codes or whatsoever to pick up containers. Containers will have to be handled and it's beforehand determined by the token and the blockchain and there is no tampering with. So today you see already business cases popping up where tokens and blockchain is really used. So um, we're already at the final part of our ingredients and that's the DAO. So we have a blockchain at the ledger, we have the smart contracts, we have, uh, we have uh, the tokens, then we have the DAO because we have people who need to work with the tokens, who need to uh, go for the conditions that triggers the smart contract, etc. So the DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. Again, decentralized autonomous. So there is no intermediary. So this organization decides how it works. So we all have a token. We can decide, for instance, how many beers we can drink tonight. And if we vote, then the smart contract will go off. It's going to be unlimited beers tonight. So that's what being decided in, uh, in a DAO. For instance, does anyone know Decentraland? <laughs> <laughs> well, Decentraland is, is uh, one of the, yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a metaverse on, a, on Ethereum blockchain. And it's also ran by a DAO. So it's like an a immersive, persistent 3, 3D virtual space where you can just do stupid, thing, run, stupid things, run around, fly through the sky, dye your hair every five seconds or change the shape of your head every two hours whatsoever. You can go to concerts, but you also can create, you can buy land. A lot of big brands also know the power of Decentraland. For instance, Adidas, Coca-Cola, they are present in uh, Decentraland. But also as a user, you can, if you own the mana, mana is a token of, uh, of Decentraland, then you have the right to vote. For instance, there are land auctions. A land auction means that <coughs> There's a certain piece of land, and when there's a land auction, you can start buying the land, and you decide, as a, a person who lives in this central land, how many land there's gonna be auct, for instance. Uh, that's gonna be sold in the auction. Um, so, yeah, you can decide what's happening in this central land. So what's really cool about this central land, you can also start buying and selling your stuff, so you can create your wearables, like for instance, this nice puffer jacket. If you design it, you can also can sell it. And that's really cool. So you can also start like in Axie Infinity, you can start your own economy, totally apart from the economy as we know it in real life. So blockchain, smart contracts, DAO or what and tokens make it possible to have a separate economy. Now in a decentral environment, it's really difficult um, 
because we're going to have a lot of worlds. Today, we're reigned by big companies. Google says, okay, you need to log in. Facebook says you need to log in. Instagram says you need to log in. Today, it's easy. It's with a fingerprint, but still, your data are duplicated. So with a blockchain, it's really difficult. So you have to identify yourself also every time. So now you are searching for the next holy grail, and that's interoperability. <sighs> difficult word, but still. The central end wants to be the first, I think the first, as I know, maybe there's someone else, but to have uh, an interoperable world working together with two other worlds. Uh, I think it's spatial and over metaverse. And they will try to do it during the metaverse fashion week. Uh, it's at the end of March. Here you see a lot of cool cats. Looks a bit stupid, but the thing is, they are gonna try to do really cool things. So they're gonna try to build a digital physical bridge of wearables. So for instance, I buy my Nike sneakers for my avatar. Well, with a digital physical bridge, I will also have the opportunity to buy them in real life. So my avatar has the same sneakers as I have in real life. Um, sounds stupid, but it's quite important. So that's why what they try to do with blockchain, they try to let it intermingle with real life. So this is the first time they're gonna build this bridge and then there is interoperability. So uh, last year we had a lot of catwalks of Dolce Cabana, Paco Rabanne, uh, Tommy Hilfiger, they did catwalks in Decentraland, but it was only in Decentraland. So now as an avatar in Decentraland, this year at the end of March, you will be able to warp from Decentraland to over to spatial with your same avatar. And that's really cool because nowadays we just log in have a different identity on Google or on Facebook or on Instagram, now we'll have the same ID in all different metaverses. So this will manage, hopefully, in the future to have all these worlds, com worlds coming together where I'm the center part of all the worlds. So cool things coming ahead. I have one last case of the metaverse because uh, you have a lot of lovers and haters. Um, but the metaverse is really powerful. Has anyone heard about this case? Uh, Wendy's, it's a hamburger joint in the States. They heard about a big food fight in Fortnite. Uh, Fortnite is not decentralized yet, but still it's a metaverse. There was a food fight between Der Burger and Pizza Pit. So they're gonna fight with hamburgers and pizzas. Wendy's was checking uh, Fortnite, how it was gonna happen and this and that. And they saw that their burger has freezers in their burger joints. And they freeze their uh, burgers they before they go to the grill. Wendy thought, this is our chance. We need to forge into, uh, we need to break into uh, Fortnite and start destroying all the freezers because there are only fresh hamburgers. So they created this little red riding hood character. And during the food fight, she started slashing all the freezers. With the result, the Twitch channel of uh, Fortnite was like completely red with what she was doing. A lot of people start following her, so a lot of people, instead of doing the food fight, they were slashing all the freezers. So in the end, um, Fortnite decided to uh, not have any freezers or uh, deep, uh, deep freeze food in, uh, in Fortnite. They decided to create a new character based on the lit a little red riding hood of Frindies. And um, yeah, uh, Fortnite scored a lot of attention with Gen Z's, uh, a crowd that is, that is difficult to reach nowadays. So yeah, metaverse, hype or not, it's a really important place. Maybe it's not for today, but it's a really important place. So there is one last ingredient, it's AI. Everyone probably worked with ChatGPT or Delhi today already. Did you get any money for that? Because you're training the dragon. In a decentralized world, you will get money for that. We've been training AI uh, for a long period now. For instance, when we're clicking in the, in the CAPTCHAs, the, the light poles, poles or the traffic lights or the car or the bicycles, we're also training AI. When we're translating words, unreadable words, we're also, words, we're also training AI. And today we're again training AI, ChatGPT, uh, Delhi, or whatsoever. 
I'm not going to talk about that because I think it's not important. We're now in the phase like it's cool, it's hype, we're training, but I think it's not going to survive. What's going to survive is that AI is needed to make Web3 easier. So we have a lot of problems, for instance, with attacks. So it's secure because a lot of computers are uh, in transactions. So it's always verified, but there are also very, very, um, a lot of attacks. So AI can uh, detect those attacks and diminish them. So then we'll keep all the good transactions. AI can also have uh, automatic tasks. So for instance, this or that needs to be done. AI will do it and it's not by uh, a person in a DAO. For instance, in the future when we will mine uh, Bitcoins, it can be that AI will do it because today we have proof of work, we have proof of stake, proof of work is, work is not sustainable. So we have to get rid of that. Proof of stake is already better, but it's not the solution. So AI will probably take over the mining of, of cryptos. It will also be the, for you guys, it will also be the, the intermediary between the decentralized app and the user because it's really difficult. Uh, it's a different uh, type of, of navigating. It's difficult to, to go around in, in, uh, in decentralized apps. So artif artificial intelligence will know what you need and will help you to show around. So in our constellation, that's the, the use of AI. Still, there is a lot of things going on with AI. Today, there is uh, Robert Alice and Altea AI who is making intelligent uh, NFTs. So this NFT will track human sentiments and will try to uh, predict how you feel. So you buy this NFT and you will be able to speak or to interact with your NFT and your NFT will know how you feel. Today, a lot of uh, AI technology, uh, and it's called strong AI, is trying to capture uh, human sentiments and predict emotions. So it will be not so silly to see uh, in the next couple of years to have an AI next to you as a colleague. So AI is becoming really important, but it won't be the reproducing chat GPT or the DALI or whatsoever. So actually this Web3, what's the fuss? So a lot of people are talking about Web3. It's difficult because I don't know, is anyone lost or or you still know what it is? Because there are few things that are important. So it's decentralization, it's the autonomy, it's trust. Eh? We are in a trustless um, environment where there is a lot of truth, so it's really difficult. So there's a lot of fuss today going on. There are a lot of experiments, a lot of startups trying to find the holy grail. So what is it actually what we are doing? When will Web3 become mature? That's really difficult to say. Um, some say it's five years, some say it's 10 years, some say it's 15 years, and will it be Web3? Web because Elon Musk is already talking about Web5. So, <laughs> and it's really centralized. So um, is it becoming decentralized? I think so. Are we gonna become autonomous? I hope so. Is interoperability possible? Yes, I really, I pray that it will be so because it's really important. A lot of startups are working on that. A lot of hypes are created, such as chat GPT or whatsoever, metaverses. But it's really important to see that Web3 is moving along. It's becoming better and better and better. And it's really used by businesses to do like serious stuff and not only fun and games. And that's all, also what Andreessen Horowitz uh, knows. This is uh, Mark Andreessen, the evil wizard of Andreessen Horowitz. He's a venture capitalist. Uh, he owns half of uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, mid last year, he invested like $4.5 billion into Web3 startups. So I think that's great that Evil Wizard is investing into Web3. It's also scary because maybe they want to uh, have the finger in the pie eh, uh, concerning decentralization. So I don't know where it's gonna, this guy is gonna end within the Web3 constellation, but the idea is that they kick-started and they accelerated very fast. So there's a lot of things happen. So the last slide, we talked about cryptos, blockchain, metaverse, artificial intelligence, and Grim Reaper entering every room and killing it. So we started with blockchain. I think somewhere uh, 
Last year, we had uh, the metaverse. The metaverse was killed by Microsoft because they were going to uh, invest more money into artificial intelligence. So I think, yes, it are buzzwords, but these buzzwords are very important because they are shaping the future of internet. So if you look beyond the hype, you will see true functionalities popping up. And that's what I end, want to end with. It's just when you start looking into uh, Web3, if you go, if you just uh, walk around in the metaverse or do a first crypto or work with artifi artificial intelligence, you have to see behind the first layer. If you go deeper, you will see the true, the true meaning of the technology and how it can be used in a, in a new in a new environment, in a new iteration of internet. So hopefully, um, yeah, it made sense. Web3, <laughs> if it did not, you can always ask questions during beers, but thank you for your attention. That was, uh, that was great, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the talk, I've, I've heard different pieces of, of talks around Web3. It's, uh, it's, I feel like I always learn something new. Um, there were a few questions online that I want to try to see if I can sort of compile into one or maybe two. Um, but they, they all kind of culminate around that meme that maybe a lot of you have seen where there's like that X axis that says fucking around and then the Y axis that says learn stuff. Uh, and then there's like that shoot that goes there. And I think we're definitely down here with Web3 where there's just like a lot of fucking around with video games and NFTs and monkeys and things like that. So, but really like um, from your opinion, like in the, we'll learn a lot by that, but where should brands be looking for like real applicable, like what's, what's like the serious stuff that, that brands should be looking at right now in terms of like how they can work with the democratization of the web? I, I think, think that sums it up. Yeah, I think the, the tokens are very important in the, in the process because tokens, create a lot of new opportunities. For instance, uh, there is like a new Spotify popping up, Audius. They also work with tokens, like artists. Uh, mm -hmm. They put on their new music on a music stream platform. Uh, uh, people can listen to it when they put it in their playlist. They get tokenized, and for instance. So it's a whole new different way of, of doing business together. So there is no intermediary anymore. So there is no, for instance, there is no uh, record company. Mm -hmm. There's no notary who, who you go, have to pass by to buy or sell a house. Yeah. That's okay. like very far horizon. Mm -hmm. But still, the, the tokens, they are very powerful. But they all need uh, blockchain <coughs> environment, smart contracts. So it has to fit together in the end. Mm -hmm. So now it's uh, basically messing around because it's not interesting to say that artificial intelligence will do automatic tasks. It's cooler that artificial intelligence produces your uh, your thesis or whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think every part is important, but tokens, to me, are the most important to look out for. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's that's good advice. Yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? It's just because there's so yeah. many. How to choose? Yeah. So I remember there was uh, with Ethereum, for example, there was once like a um, somebody stole money, and they um, the, the community said, "What should we do? Should we pay this person back?" And it was uh, Vitalik, I think. He, uh, the, the, the founder. The founder yeah. said, "Okay, we'll pay them back." But that's not very decentralized. How do you look at those kind of situations when there's with something really happens and you have to intervene? Uh, like, I think the, the thing you're referring to it happened with smart contracts. Like there was a, a leaking smart contract. So it's really difficult in the beginning to have like a solid smart contract because once you install it, you can really simply uninstall it. So when it works, it starts working and when you know the, the loophole, you can steal money. Um, it's difficult to, to say what's to be done. You can ask the crowd, like all the members of your DAO, because Ethereum uh, is totally run by volunteers who work together. Um, so it's really difficult to say, like, because when you say you need to pay the money back and then money is gone, so where are you going to get the money? So it's yeah, difficult. Exactly. You have like a certain amount of coins, so that's also difficult. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I can't answer that. 
But the thing is, um, they, they had this smart contract problem and they, they tried to fix it, but that's still the, yeah, the immature mm -hmm. phase of, of blockchain. Mm -hmm. So normally it can't happen, but it happens because they're just discovering new technology like smart contracts. You can ask your DAO to pay back, to pay back the money, but still. Yeah. But it's never going to be perfect. Like nothing is ever perfect. No, it's, it's not perfect. perfect. That's why I talk about it's like a catch-all term of a lot of technologies, a lot of innovations. If you ask me, like what's important, like tokens is important, like smart contracts are important, but not everything. Like I don't believe in Chat GPT producing my text, for instance, but I believe in AI making my life simpler and connecting the dots without me connecting the dots, like the tasks I need to do daily, but I don't want uh, chat GPT to reason for me, mm -hmm. would be totally crazy. Any other questions? I've got one more online that I think is interesting. Um, it says, how do we tackle longevity when a large part of the world is being excluded right now already? So it, I think it's talking about wealth inequality. So we're building a new model, but already it's the wealthy ones that are setting the rules. And even though it's democratized, yeah, that's the autonomy course. Yeah. Actually, it's, it's, it's the best way of democracy because you're going to decide as a user what you want to share. For instance, mm -hmm. I'm the middle of the network. I decide what I want to share with Google. So I don't want to click anymore those stupid light poles or those traffic lights for free. Mm -hmm. I want to get paid for that because I'm training the dragon. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to be paid, for instance, for doing stuff. Um, so for instance, you can run retargeting ads on me, but you're going to pay me mm -hmm. to do so, for instance. Okay. Yeah, for instance, like Audius, I have, uh, for instance, uh, Deadmau5 is one of the founders of Audius, the, the DJ producer, dance DJ. If I'm a fan of Deadmau5 on Audius, and I put his music in my playlist and I promote him, I get paid with the tokens of audience to do so. Mm -hmm. So it's like a small amount, but it's in a way it's very democratic. So it's not big tech is gonna decide for me what to do, but I will decide what to do uh, with my presence online. So all of this tech click data that we're giving away right now, it's being collected and monetized by companies, will actually yeah. get a cut of that. Yeah, huh. that will be cut out. So I will be the center and it's not Google or Facebook that are going to be the center. I'm going to be the center and I'm going to decide which data to part to, to share with which company or whatsoever. Gotcha. Yeah, proof of stake instead of proof of work. Yeah. Proof of stake means if you have enough money, basically, or tokens, you can vote on future yeah. changes in the chain. Well. So that's yeah, also a bit on what you were saying. Is yeah, yeah. I bought a lot of Ethereum and yeah. it was really cheap, yeah. uh, let's say. That's not really true. <laughs> uh, That's still now yeah. uh, it's become worth more. Mm -hmm. Now I have the power because I was first in that cycle and now I can change, say, oh, this is going to happen in the future. Because yeah, before it was proof of work on Ethereum uh, and it had a lot of uh, power. Mm -hmm to uh, make the transaction work. Now it's proof of stake, then you need to have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So they are looking into ways to demo make it more democratic. Mm -hmm. So we have to give them time and, and, and they will try to find a way that they, were, they will need to go. But it's not like over one night that they will change everything into the most democratic system. That's but gonna be the challenge. They did that, they changed to proof of stake because of sustainability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, I heard about that. What is inclusion for in this entire? You have a lot of people being digitally excluded in this country, by the way. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the XC use case, a lot of Filipinos entered their uh, internet cafe around the corner to play X Infinity. I think there's. A lot of inclusion, but we also go always going to exclude people because there's no internet like all over the world. Mm -hmm. I've traveled from from North America to South America, South America, and I remembered having like no internet for three weeks in Bolivia. So it happens. Still a separate issue to solve. Yeah, separate connectivity. Because yeah. um, 
if, you're, if you own your data and, and you can uh, earn money by doing things on the internet, it's, it's inclusion. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Now it's not inclusion. Now it's like big tech deciding for you what happens. And yeah, yeah. You have to follow the rules. Yeah, yeah. Can that take away the uh, governance? If there is no one actually governing this autonomy. That That's also a, a difficult thing nowadays because um, a lot of governments want to make rules for uh, Web3, metaverses, blockchain, and whatsoever. So Europe is doing a lot of things to do so. They're also creating digital dollars, euros, to make, uh, to make, yeah, to tackle the, the Bitcoin and the crypto market. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of things going on. That's why I say it's, it's the, the horizon for a fully mature Web3 is maybe five years, but that's really optimistic. So it can be 15 years or 10 years, but really have to think in those um, decentralized environments and also in more autonomy. Mm -hmm. That's really important. But when it's going to be mature, I don't know. We're still very early in the uh, fucking around stage. So um, thank you so much for your talk. It was uh, great to hear, and I hope it inspired people. <laughs>